Hi, I'm Stephanie Craig. Welcome to the History Fangirl Podcast. This is episode five, Agamemnon's Mycenae. Few characters in Greek literature have inspired as many as have Agamemnon, of whom Aeschylus wrote in the Arestia, Take Agamemnon, the powers in heaven permitted him to capture Priam's town, to return home honored by the gods. But now, if he must pay the penalty for blood which other men before him shed, and die in retribution for the dead he killed himself, what mortal human beings who hears all this can boast he lives in life unscarred by fate? What do we know of the real Agamemnon and his real city beyond what's been handed down to us in literature? Who were the Mycenaeans, and how did their city come to rise and to fall? My guest today is John Bennett, director of the British School of Athens and professor of Aegean archaeology at the University of Sheffield. We discuss the Agamemnon from literature, the discovery of what we know today as his mask and tomb, and how the original Mycenaeans compare to their literary counterparts. At the end of this episode, find out how to enter this week's contest. All right. Today's guest is Professor John Bennett. He's the director of the British School of Athens. He's also a professor of Aegean Archaeology at the University of Sheffield. Welcome, John. Hi, Stephanie. So first question, tell us a little bit about your role um, and your work with Mycenae. Well, I'm director of the British School and um, uh, the British School is one of the uh, organisations that has carried out some field work at the site of Mycenae. We're not the only organisation that has worked there, but uh, we worked there in the 1920s, 1939 and, and into the 1950s. So uh, one of the things that the British School does is it uh, sponsors archaeological investigations by UK-based uh, academics uh, in Greece. Uh, And we do that with permission from the Ministry of Culture and Sport of the Greek state. Now, how did you initially become interested in Greek archaeology? Because you are obviously not from Greece, or or maybe you are, but I'm taking from your accent that you're not from Greece originally. So how did you become interested in this for your profession? Well, I did uh, classical Greek and Latin when I was in high school and then read classics at university in Cambridge. And through the languages, really, I got interested in the material culture of Greece in particular, less so of of Rome. And one of the things that I was particularly uh, captivated by was the undeciphered, until 1952, script, which is called Linear B, which was written uh, on clay tablets mostly, and produced between about 1400 BC and 1200 BC, and it recorded an early form of Greek. And as it happened at the decipherment in 1952, one of the people who taught me, John Chadwick, had been involved with uh, Michael Ventris. He and Ventris, in fact, published the first collection of documents. And so I got interested really in, in Bronze Age Greece, which my senior is one of the most important sites through uh, an interest in the script that had been used there. Wow, that's incredible. What was it like working with someone who had been a part of that? Did he have interesting stories to tell? We mostly met when I was an undergraduate in quite formal circumstances in in what we would refer to as tutorials, they're called supervisions in Cambridge. I got to know John Chadwick better as as a postgraduate student. Um, And... um, Yes, there were some uh, interesting stories, but uh, he wasn't um, uh, someone who traded, if you like, on his fame, as it were. He was quite a a modest individual. Well, that's incredibly interesting. So as far as the Mycenaeans, most people, I think, if they've heard of them, are more aware of them appearing in Homer and in literature than maybe the historical, physical place. Do you want to give us a little bit of an overview of their appearance in Homer? Well, oddly enough, the Mycenaeans strictly, I think, only appear once in Homer in part of the Iliad, in the second book of the of the Iliad. There's a long catalogue of all the Greek forces that are going to take part in the siege of Troy. And those are named by the, the major um, cities, as one would call them, that, that were sending mostly ships. And... Um, among those are the Mycenaeans, the people of the city of Mycenae, led by Agamemnon, who, of course, was the, along with Menelaus, were the leaders of the of the Greek force. The Greeks in Homer are actually not called Greeks. 
Um, that's a, a later term for, for Greeks that comes actually through Latin. But uh, they're variously referred to as Achaeans or Danaeans or Argeans and um, not as, as Mycenaeans. So Mycenaean as a term for the people is largely a modern name and it's based on the fact that Mycenae came to be what we call the type site, the site that defined that culture, if you like, for modern uh, academics. Oh, wow. What do we know historically about the real Mycenaeans that is different from what we see in Homer? Or, or were they not in Homer enough for us really to know much about them? Since Agamemnon is associated with Mycenae, by definition, the Mycenaean or a Mycenaean, Agamemnon himself, is very prominent throughout uh, throughout the epic. And of course, he does uh, turn up by reference in, in the Odyssey as well. The picture we have of the, if we want to call them the Mycenaeans, either the people of Bronze Age Greece, that comes in Homer is, of course, obviously a warlike people who liked uh, the glory of combat. The Iliad is essentially a war story, so inevitably that's its subject matter. And we get to probably get a better picture of, of what, how Homer or how Homer's audience conceived of life uh, in the Bronze Age from the Odyssey, where we see the palace of Odysseus um, functioning on Ithaca, as it were. The overriding impression we have from Homer is that despite the fact that the Homeric heroes meet gods on the battlefield and in life and so on, and have quite spectacular uh, pieces of weaponry and so on, the sort of picture we have of life is actually in many ways much simpler than the picture we have from the archaeology and from the Linear B about the actual Late Bronze Age. So there's no reference in Homer, for example, explicitly to the massive fortification walls, the massive stone fortification walls that you can see if you visit both Mycenae and Tiryns and other sites uh, in Greece, or of the very elaborate wall paintings or frescoes, as we sometimes call them, that uh, decorated the walls of places like Mycenae and Tiryns and also, of course, Knossos uh, on Crete. As far as the site goes, since now we're talking about the physical location, when did it start being inhabited and what do we know about life specifically at the site of Mycenae? The site itself um, has remains which go back to the Neolithic period. And in Greek terms, that's somewhere between 7,000 and 6,000 BC. We're not sure about anything in between, but then the the early Bronze Age uh, is represented. And there we're talking about the period from about 3,000 to 2,000 BC. But those are just remains like potsherds and some other things, but there's no substantial remains of architecture on the site. Because the site was so built up at the end of the Bronze Age in the, the 13th century BC, many of the earlier remains have been covered or removed by later generations who occupied the site. But we can say that the site must have had some people living there, uh, let's say, in the 7th millennium BC and in the 3rd millennium BC. And it really picks up as we move into the second millennium, so after 2000 BC, and by the middle of that uh, that millennium, by 1600, 1500, we have some of the most uh, substantial remains at the site. As far as the people there, so when I was there, I saw you know tombs of royalty, and there were, and you could definitely see different buildups over time where different groups had you know, moved the walls and things like that. What do we know about the growth of the city? Well, the city that you see bounded by the, those massive walls is very much the centre for the elite. So that is the place where there was a palace. It incorporated an earlier uh, set of tombs, which very probably were seen as the ancestral tombs of those people who were the predecessors of the, the then ruling generation. But all the way around the site, there are remains outside the walls, that is, there are remains of less uh, impressive, but sometimes still quite elaborate households. And the whole site probably extended over something like 30 hectares in extent. So many of the hill slopes um, uh, over to the, the west of the site, coming south from the site down towards the Treasury of Atreus, so-called would have probably had a habitation on them. And so it was actually quite a substantial city with several thousand inhabitants. Was it larger than other cities at the time or how did it compare? 
It will have been one of the largest cities at the time in mainland Greece, um, possibly Thebes uh, in Boeotia to the north uh, of Athens in central Greece may actually have been larger as a, as a city, um, but not by much. Knossos on Crete at the time that Mycenae was just beginning to, to reach its acme was probably larger, may even have been twice as large when Knossos was at its peak, which would be sometime around about the end of the period of the so-called shaft graves at Mycenae, just about the time that the first Tholos tombs were being built at Mycenae. But by the time Mycenae was truly great, Knossos had lost some of its size and, and power as well. In school, we learned a lot about Greek mythology and traveling around Greece. It's reinforced uh, most of the places what the different gods and goddesses and how they were worshipped. But what do we know specifically about the way the Mycenaeans worshipped the Greek gods? And what was was their religion? Were there any particulars to their religion that might have been different than the generic version we get taught in school? Well, we have some of the, the same names in Linear B documents, mostly not from Mycenae, from the site of Pylos in the southwest uh, part of the Peloponnese, the opposite end of the Peloponnese from where Mycenae is. Um, so we know that the, the god's name uh, Poseidon seems to have been a very prominent name. Uh, we know of a Zeus. We know of Dionysus as well. So some of the, the god names are, are attested in the Bronze Age, which implies uh, a degree of continuity. Some of them are not. In particular, there's a figure called Potnia. Um, that's a title. It probably means something like lady. Uh, and this may have been a single female deity, or it may have been a multiple form of, of deity. In that form, doesn't seem to come later, although the, the Potnia is a term that appears in later Greek. We know from the Linear B documents that um, the gods were offered uh, various things, including, including perfumed olive oil and wine and honey and so on, and those are also attested in later Greek. And we also know from archaeological evidence from animal bones uh, preserved at sites like Mycenae and elsewhere, that uh, there were feasts held on certain occasions. It's very likely that at least some of those feasts were religious in nature. And some of the most recent evidence that is, is coming up suggests that they involve sacrifice, involving burning. And so it may well be that there was actually much more continuity, both in practice as well as in some of the names from the Bronze Age uh, to the later classical period than, than we had thought perhaps 20 or 30 years ago. What did the classical Greeks of, you know, Athens and Sparta, what did they know about Mycenae? Well, Mycenae continued to be occupied from, uh, there was a big destruction at Mycenae around about um, 1200 BC, let's say, and the site shrunk quite considerably at that time and was no longer, the fortifications were no longer renewed uh, beyond that period. But people continued to live there and the Myc Mycenae was a city-state in the same way that places like Athens and Sparta and much smaller places as well were city-states, right down to 468 BC. So, for example, the, when the Persians uh, invaded Greece, the allied Greek cities who opposed them included the citizens of Mycenae. So Mycenae did exist beyond uh, the Bronze Age. Now, those people who lived there in the first half of the second millennium before 468 BC must have been aware of the massive uh, fortification walls and some of the large tombs uh, that existed. So in a sense, they were encountering regularly the material remains of their great past. And one way of reading the Homeric poems and other similar poems that haven't survived for us but must have existed is that this was effectively a way of creating a history for places like Mycenae and Tiryns and, and others, uh, other uh, great cities which were in many cases associated with real places where people continue to live. What happened to make the site become uninhabited eventually? Right. Mycenae, along with many other sites uh, on the mainland of Greece, uh, suffered a destruction. Uh, in fact, two major episodes of destruction, one around about the middle of the 13th century, so around about 1250 uh, BC, evidenced by burning, some people suggest that it may have been caused by an earthquake, and in ancient times, an earthquake will often knock over olive oil lamps and, and other incendiary devices, as it were. So a fire destruction is not always caused by human action deliberately, so it could have been caused by earthquake. 
The site was refortified. In fact, its fortifications were extended following that destruction. And then about 1200 BC, the, the site uh, suffered another destruction. It seems to have been the, the large scale construction um, ceased uh, on the site. And effectively, it ceased to function as a pal- palatial site as it had before. Interestingly, down the road at Tiryns, which is only a few kilometers away, there was some attempt after that period of 1200 BC to sort of reconstruct a smaller, almost like a temple uh, within uh, the main palace at Tiryns. And it may be that at Tiryns, some form of authority tried for maybe a century to maintain the same kind of palatial life uh, as it existed. Doesn't seem to be direct evidence for that at Mycenae, but it is possible that that did actually happen. But by 1100 BC, the site was uh, simply a very small site with some people, there were remains of burials from that period, and people were probably living in the area, but they weren't living in massive stone-built palaces surrounded by walls and so on. Although people continued to live there, in 468 BC, the site was destroyed yet again, uh, this time by its neighbours from the city of Argos, which is across the, the plain Uh, from Mycenae, and that seems to have more or less definitively ended it as a significant city. There was some rehabilitation in the Hellenistic period, so the period after 300 BC, but effectively Mycenae became a ruin after 468 BC. Do we know what happened during the time that it was a ruin up through the modern age? Well, we know for sure that the remains were visible because in the middle of the 2nd century AD, uh, so around about 150 AD, the Greek writer Pausanias, who was a travel writer, who wrote a, a wonderful description, a wonderfully detailed description of Greece in his time, visited the site of Mycenae and talks about the Lion Gate and talks about some of the large tholos tombs, as we would call them. He called them treasuries. So he clearly saw and appreciated the, the remains. And then we have attestations from the very early, very beginning of the 19th century, where British travellers uh, like William Gell, travelled uh, to the site and saw the, the Lion Gate and indeed drew there's some rather nice early 19th century both engravings and watercolours of the Lion Gate as it survived at that date. So unlike many sites, it, it wasn't completely forgotten. It moved from being a site lived in among its ruins to a set of ruins to which stories were attached by people like Pausanias and then in much later generations by Western travellers to the region. How was it rediscovered as an archaeological site? So, I mean, people, as I was saying, just like Gell and and Dodwell and so on, who visited the site and many others, obviously saw the remains there. The first excavations, so the first systematic uncovering of the remains, were actually in 1841 by a a Greek archaeologist called Kyriakos Pitakis. And then the most famous early modern excavations, as it were, were by Heinrich Schliemann, who in 1876 uncovered the big grave circle, which is now within the main fortification walls. But at the time that it was actually built, it was obviously still within the fortification walls in Schliemann's day. But when it was first built, it was actually outside uh, the walls of the citadel. So Schliemann uncovered that, assisted by Panagiotis Stamatakis from the Archaeological Society of Athens. And it's in that cemetery, that uh, the, the, the series of so-called shaft graves, that he supposedly gazed upon a gold face mask and said he had gazed upon the face of Agamemnon. <laughs> Schliemann, of course, uh, consistent with his vision of these remains as being the material remains of the Homeric poems, as it were, associated this with uh, the, the Homeric hero associated with My- Mycenae, a- Agamemnon himself. And then excavations continued with the Greek archaeologist Christos Tsundas, towards the end of the 19th century. And then, as I mentioned, uh, the British school uh, excavated there in 1920 to 23, again in 1939, and then in the 1950s, Helen Weiss conducting the first uh, set of um, excavations and Lord William Taylor, uh, the last set ending in 1969. And it continues to be excavated by the Archaeological Society of Athens as well, uh, by a number of archeologists. I want to pause for a moment to talk about our sponsor, Audible. For you, the listener of the History Fangirl podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. For today's episode, I thought instead of recommending a book, I would recommend The Modern Scholar, History of Ancient Greece by Eric H. Klein. 
One of the things that I like to do on Audible is to purchase lecture series because these are often written by professors. This one is by a George Washington University professor. And one of the great things is I feel a lot of times like I have forgotten something that I learned in school and I don't want a book that covers that thing in depth. I kind of want to revisit the course in a more pleasurable way, in a more grown-up way, without the homework. And that's why I listen, I've listen. i listened to a lot of Modern Scholar Lecture Series. They're always really interesting, and I always come away feeling like there's one or two topics in there I want to delve more into, and I'm refreshed on the general overview. And this one looked especially good, especially if you are listening to this episode and thinking, I can place a lot of these ancient Greek names, but I don't remember the big picture. This is going to go into the big picture in a way that you feel like you've really come away with those big sweeping themes the way you would have if you were in college, but you're not going to be hungover and you're not going to have a paper to write at the end of it. So to download your free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl to get your free audiobook or in this case, lecture series. So Howard Schleyman is an interesting and controversial figure. Do you want to share a little bit about his background for uh, those that may not kind of know his overall archaeological history? Well, Heinrich Schliemann was um, uh, essentially a businessman. He was, we would say, German now. I think he's actually from Prussia. Germany didn't exist at the time he was born. And he made a lot of money, including money made in the California gold rush. Oh, wow. I did not know that. That's amazing. (laughs) He used that money to um, fund explorations, uh, first of all, at Troy. He had uh, had taken uh, one view of where the ancient city of Troy was supposed to be at a a place called Hisalik uh, on the northeastern coast of modern Turkey, and he sank massive uh, trenches in there. Schliemann was of the view that the Homeric poems were real in the sense that they contained the memories of of an actual history. And so he used those poems, as it were, to guide him to uncover the physical remains behind them, and therefore, in his mind, to put the characters of the epic, Priam in the case of Troy, Agamemnon in the case of Mycenae, into these actual sites. And it's that practice that means that we talk about the Palace of Minos at Knossos, we talk about uh, the Palace of Nestor down at Pylos, and so on, because of this principle which really established was really established by Schliemann that we were excavating the remains of what the Greeks knew uh, the ancient Greeks knew as the the heroic age. Uh, Not all archaeologists would agree with that nowadays in the sense that the relationship between the Homeric poems is much more complicated. The poems themselves were composed in the 7th century BC perhaps or even the 8th in the form we have them Uh, so they aren't historical in that sense and they were poems and they were orally composed but also we would take a very different view of the process of excavating now. Schliemann worked very quickly with a very large workforce, uncovering huge amounts very quickly, meaning that the level of detail was was far from ideal, and we excavate much more slowly and much more carefully, and also with many more techniques nowadays that allow us to understand remains of animal bones, remains of seeds, even the, the chemical composition, of course, we do radiocarbon dating and so on. Um, none of those techniques were available to Schliemann at the time. So from what I remember about Schliemann's excavations at Troy, a lot of the treasure of Troy was removed from the Ottoman Empire. Did that happen with the excavations at Mycenae? It did not, no. Most of the remains from Schliemann's excavations you can see in the Archaeological Museum in Athens. At the time, The Greek archaeological service, if you like, or the Greek archaeological community was much, very much centered. So those remains came to Athens. And so you can see uh, the remains of of Schliemann in the National Archaeological Museum. But um, there is now an on-site museum at Mycenae, which contains the remains of much of the more recent excavations. Uh, So the British excavations since the war and so on, and other other excavations on the site. So there is a very... It's not a huge museum, but it's a very well-stocked museum with some very interesting finds actually on site. And that's more of the pattern nowadays, that remains from particular sites will be displayed locally rather than brought centrally uh, to Athens as they were in Schliemann's day. 
Schliemann is the reason that we refer to the gold mask that's in uh, the Archaeological Museum in Athens as Agamemnon's mom's mask. And he's why we call the largest Thales tomb, I believe it's the largest, Agamemnon's tomb. And that was just something he decided as a, um, did he believe it? Was it a marketing ploy? What do we know about his decision to do that? He presents himself as believing all of this. I mean, he, he invents, uh, well, he either tells or invents stories about himself referring to the Homeric legends when he was a child and so on. He was obviously a well-educated, a classically educated man, an elite uh, member at the time, although he wasn't a professional archaeologist. Whether he, I don't know, whether he believed it. His vision, if you like, was consistent with the idea that archaeology was about bringing out the material remains in order to help us visualize the texts. And in that sense, I mean, whether he believed it as literal truth or whether he was simply doing what many, many archaeologists were doing at the time almost doesn't matter. I mean, he, he was engaging in a practice that was widespread. And many archaeologists now would say that archaeology has much to contribute even when there aren't texts. And in fact, perhaps even sometimes, especially when there aren't texts, because texts give a particular view of things and a very fixed view of things and a very localized view of things. So, for example, much of what we know about Greece is because of texts that we found that, that are associated with the city-state of Athens in the 5th century. But we don't have similar literary texts from, from Thebes, from Corinth, historical documents about them, but not the same level of information. So Schliemann was participating in what was current in the 19th century, the, the, the recovery of material remains to elucidate the text. And in his case, the text was the Homeric text. What do we know about the real history of what we call Agamemnon's mask and Agamemnon's tomb? Well, the tombs, the, the large Tholos tombs, of which there are nine at Mycenae, which is more than at any other, any other site in Bronze Age Greece, they were, in ter- they were all robbed in antiquity, probably. So we have very few finds from within the tombs themselves. We can reconstruct their chronology by looking at the archaeology. And it seems that the earliest tomb was probably built sometime around about, uh, let's say, 1600 or 1500 BC, and the latest perhaps as late as 1300 BC. The largest one was actually referred to in antiquity as the, as the treasury of Atreus, the, the father of uh, Agamemnon and Menelaus. So tradition associated it with, with Atreus. Um, Schliemann thought that he had gazed upon the face of Agamemnon looking at one of the gold face masks from the shaft graves, which are earlier than the Tholos tombs by uh, several generations and of a different type. They're very large, basically rectangular holes in the ground into which multiple burials were successively placed and and then filled in and and a grave marker placed over them. And you can see all of that stuff in the museums, uh, both at Mycenae and in Athens. Interestingly enough, a colleague, uh, Oliver Dickinson in Britain, looked very carefully at Schliemann's diaries. And uh, although there was this famous telegram that he sent uh, to the King of Greece saying, I have gazed upon the face of Agamemnon, it probably wasn't the most famous and most elaborate gold mask, the one, the one with the beard, which is always shown as the, the sort of um, icon, if you like, of, of Mycenae. It was probably another one that he, that he was looking at at the time. Oh, wow. How did that switch happen? Do we know? Well, it's in the article, and I, I, I can't actually recall the details now, but I think essentially it's that um, the, it, it seemed inevitable to, to the public, if you like, that this must be the one that people looked at because it was the most elaborate. But uh, when you look carefully at the diaries, I think, um, I, I think it must be that it hadn't been discovered yet or, or, um, or he actually described something about another one that, that he, was, he was looking at. That's really interesting. Your work contributes to the modern preservation and archaeology at the site. Tell us a little bit about what's going on there now. Well, the site, um, since 1999, uh, both Mycenae and Tyrians have been inscribed as World Heritage Sites. Um, and so they are both very well laid out for visiting. So there's a very easy way to walk around uh, the site without obviously damaging uh, the remains. Some of the tombs, some of the Tholos tombs, which are closer to the site, are also available to visit. There is this, as I said, this museum, which is all more or less on the site. It's about 50 meters away. So in terms of preservation, the site is is very well conserved and very easy to move around as a visitor. 
And as I mentioned, I mean, work does continue, not so much in the main citadel itself, but um, in areas around about. The, some areas of the site are not visible because they involve um, a lot of interior architecture in Bronze Age Greece was made with mud brick. Understandably, if mud brick gets exposed to excessive moisture, uh, then it can decay. And also it's, it's more fragile, obviously, than stone. So some of those areas are actually roped off and not visible to tourists, although you can see where they are. And that's unfortunately where some of the more interesting remains in relation to religious practice at the time but the actual finds aren't visible in the museum, so you can actually still see those. How do you all decide where you're going to excavate? It really depends. If you're trying to move into an area which is not well understood, the first thing you might well do is conduct a large-scale walking survey, which means you walk over quite large areas of the landscape, perhaps as much as um, 20 kilometers, 20 square kilometers in a, in a season of exploration. And then using the surface remains that you see from there, you might decide that one or two sites are particularly rich in finds or of a particular date that you're interested in, and then return and do uh, trial excavations on those. Most often, sites are fairly well known in the sense that when a a site is ploughed, for example, as as many sites are, I mean, not through anyone's fault, but because they happen to be in the ground and people carry out agriculture, stuff comes to the surface and so people know where those sites are. In the case of Mycenae, of course, it was already known that the site was there because it was known back in antiquity that there had been a great uh, site there. Another technique that we use when we know there's a site there but we want to determine where most effectively to excavate is to use some form of what's called geophysics, which means looking either at um, magnetic signatures of what's underneath the ground, we call it magnetometry, or resistivity by passing a very small electrical current through the ground and looking, measuring how quickly or slowly that comes back to another, another terminal. And um, by a combination of those two, you can often see walls, uh, streets. You can either see solid or hollow things. So you can see streets or, or walls and stuff like that. And that will often help guide people to where there may be um, large buildings or concentrations of very highly magnetized material, which might be indications of burning and so on. So so we can do quite a lot before we actually commit the very expensive uh, process of, of excavating. And we excavate, as I said, much more slowly than, than in Schliemann's day. So it is quite a big decision to, to actually go in and, and excavate. Do you all have a list of sites you would like to get to that you've done all of the pre-work for and are just in line waiting for funds to excavate? Or do you find them and then work on that area and then move on? It usually happens that, I mean, it's rarely that that a sort of single individual will decide to excavate at a site that that has never been known before. So what normally happens is that, um, you know, an area has, people have certain knowledge about a certain area and uh, a team of people will decide that they would want to do more work in that particular area, uh, identify a particular site. And of course, because in, from my perspective and from other others' perspectives, we are working as guests of the Greek Ministry of Culture and Sports. We make contact, obviously, with local archaeologists whom we, we mostly know anyway, to talk about the work that we plan to do. And then, as I mentioned, we have to apply for permission to get a permit to allow us to to actually carry out that excavate, that project. What, in your opinion, is the significance of Mycenae to modern Greece and also to ancient Greek history? Well, Mycenae is probably one of the most impressive sites just physically in its appearance and in the extent of the remains there uh, from the Greek Bronze Age. And in many people's view, it probably was the chief city uh, in Greece which wasn't a single country at the time. It was a set of smaller uh, polities, as we might call it. Um, But uh, it was, um, in many people's view, it was the leading uh, polity in that region. Some people would argue that Mycenae was the place to which the Hittites referred as Achiawa. That goes along with the Greek term Achaeans uh, that we find in Homer. Others disagree that it was specifically one uh, city, Some people believe it might have been Thebes, a city further north. It's impressive as a physical site to visit with all the remains, including the the very large tombs, some of which are incredibly impressive to visit. But also this 
role that it probably had in the Bronze Age as being one of the major players and a player that was obviously connected in its heyday with Crete and also with further uh, east and the eastern Mediterranean, places like Ugarit and ultimately through to Syria and Mesopotamia. If someone was going to travel to Mycenae, what would you suggest are the sites they need to make sure to see? What would be a good amount of time to spend there? You know, what would you suggest for a tourist? I think depending on how much time and how much stamina you have for archaeological sites, I would always start at the main site itself. There's a a, a big uh, parking lot, so if you're driving there, it's easy to park. If you're coming in a bus, uh, it puts you quite close to the site. And then you walk up past some of the burial uh, sites uh, right up to the Lion Gate. It's a bit steep in places, but as I said, there's a very well-graded walkway around the site. And in order to do it justice, you would need at least an hour to go around the main site, possibly an hour and a half or two if you want to take your time over it. And then having gone around the main site, I think a bit of a rest from the sun if you're doing it in the summer is to go uh, the short distance to the uh, the museum, which uh, again, depending on your stamina and so on, is well worth at least an hour. And then on your way back out of the site, as you're driving down back towards modern village of Mykines, or Mycenae, as they call it, you should stop at the so-called Treasury of Atreus, the largest and most impressive of the Solos tombs, uh, which uh, there's a little parking lot there and you can walk up. It's uh, all about I did 50, maybe 100 metres from the parking lot there. And um, so you can, if you get there early, if you get there at nine in the morning, you could probably go off uh, back to somewhere like Nafplion and have a, a late-ish lunch and have uh, have really uh, done my scene. I spent probably 30 minutes in Nafplion and it was beautiful. So I highly recommend finishing your day there as well. <laughs> I did not get to spend enough time there. And curiously enough, if you go up onto the Palamidi, the, the Venetian fort above Nafplion, which has a lot of steps, but you can get there by, by road as well, a bit longer way, it's quite possible that some of the stones from Mycenae were actually removed when the Venetians were looking desperately for stone to build uh, that fortification. I mean, they obviously come from many other places, but some of the stuff from Mycenae may well have come from there. Oh, wow. What is your favourite spot in Mycenae? I think I have probably have three I think the treasury of Atreus standing inside that and just appreciating the scale is absolutely incredible. And there's a wonderful view out as you look out through the back out through the doorway of the tomb, which leads you right up to the citadel as well. You can see the citadel from there. And that's no accident, I think, by the design of the the builders. Uh, The second thing is actually looking at the over the grave circle, the Schliemann excavated grave circle A, as it's called, which is the one just inside the fortification walls, because that is there's so much both ancient, i.e. Mycenaean history there, but also so much of the history of the discipline in the way that Schliemann uh, started it. Um, and then I actually like to stand as close as you can get up to the top of the citadel and look back over the whole the whole site where you can see, of course, the treasury of Atreus, so-called, and all the other buildings around uh, Mycenae. But you also look out onto the whole Argive plain and you can see the sea just in the distance, if you're careful, you can just about pick out um, pick out Tyrans, I think, um, which is actually Argos across across the plain. And that that if you do that first thing in the morning when it's still quite clear and reasonably cool, that's absolutely a beautiful view. I stood in all three of those spots, but I didn't have the appreciation when I was there for what I was looking at necessarily because obviously I have a different background. So I will have to go back. <laughs> Good. Well, John, thank you so much for joining us. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Come back anytime. There's so much stuff in Greece I'd love to talk about. Good. I want to say thank you again to John Bennett for coming on the show. For those who have subscribed to the show already, thank you. If you want more episodes, please subscribe in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And please take a moment to rate and review the show. It helps tremendously with helping others find the podcast. For our next episode, we will be going over the history of the lost city of Petra in Jordan. My guest will be Jane Taylor, an author and photographer who has published multiple books on this fascinating city. The prize for this week's giveaway is a $20 Amazon gift card. If you'd like to enter, follow the link in the show notes to the blog post on this episode on historyfangirl.com. All you have to do to enter is be a newsletter subscriber and leave a comment on that post. Good luck.